So if you have your Bible open there before you, please read, read with me from Psalm 139 and verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from my spirit, to whither shall I flee from my presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. I'll finish the reading there at the end of verse 12, Psalm 139. The message for this evening, our study, is simply this, where God is, where God is. But before we come to the study of Scripture, I shall pray, and I trust that you'll pray along with me as we uh, turn to God's Word. Our gracious Father in heaven, in thy presence we bow and we pause for this time and once again to acknowledge that thou art worthy. And Lord, we can say, who is a pardoning God like thee and who has grace so rich and free? We thank you for the, uh, the words of many hymns which we treasure in our hearts. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. And truly, O God, as we contemplate thy word, there is a call that comes to our heart. As we read the scriptures, we read the Bible, and we know, Lord, as we look at these great and these wonderful truths in the scripture, they call us to yourself. They show us how great God is. We look around and we see men, we see mankind, we see his need, we see his struggles, we see his inadequacies, we see his weaknesses and all his fears. And then there is God and his truth and his ways. As for God, his ways are perfect. I pray that, Lord, you would speak to many people in these days and that you would waken them from their spiritual stupor and from their spiritual deadness and that you would give life. Pray, Lord, that you would forgive us our sins. We know as we come before you, there must be cleansing. There must be the due preparation of our hearts. Oh God, I need it. And we all alike need the same thing. Pray for those in our church especially. Maybe have needs, physical needs, temporal needs. Lord, spiritual concerns. Be gracious unto them. Bless your church, Lord, throughout this world. Encourage them in these days. Bind it together. Root out all the things which harm and destroy, and add to it daily such as should be saved. Help us now around your word as we take time to study it together. And bless all uh, brethren who are preaching and teaching the word of God this, this evening and throughout this week. May it be most profitable to all who listen in these days. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So going back to Psalm 139, uh, the study will be uh, this evening from verse 6 and finishing at the end of verse 12, where God is. Aren't you glad when you read certain verses and passages and portions of the Bible, the Word of God, which have been penned by what we might like to say some of the great heroes of the faith, that they make you realise and uh, understand that they, as individuals, thought and they felt just like you and just like I, we think and we feel today. God has been so kind to us in this respect, I believe. He's been so good to us in giving the Holy Scriptures. Now, we are to understand, and I trust that we do this evening, that primarily when we think of the Scripture, 
which has been given to us. God's special revelation. Now this is a revelation of God to our hearts and to our lives. It is the revelation of himself unto us. It is the most gracious gift that God has given uh, to this world and to ourselves and to his church. And we know also that when we read the scriptures that God unfolds his matchless and his timeless and his unrivaled plan of salvation. What a, a mighty plan, we might say, uh, that God had devised in the covenant of grace in choosing to save a people to himself. And you read the Bible, you read the scriptures, and as we know, dear Christian friends, and all who may be listening this evening, that these are the, the main truths that confront us, who God is, and the things which God has done. And all these things, as they are found and concentrated and focused on the person and the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. But also, we might say as a secondary detail, when you read the scriptures, and there are many things we glean and we take from the word of God, that it is as we study scripture, the Lord shows us how it is his pleasure and it is his will to work through and in vessels of clay. We simply refer to human beings, those who are set apart, his own children, and used for the glory and the honour of God. And when you study the, the lives and the characters and the individuals of the word of God, and we see them to be individuals of, of similar passions as we are, there's this strange sense of comfort which overcomes us, that we can stand alongside these people and realise that we are like them and that they are like us. I mention all this because when I come to the words of verse 6 of Psalm 139, I'm so glad I read these words. I'm so glad as we make our way through this psalm, and already we've dealt with a couple of messages and studies in verses 1 to 5, and we thought of uh, living in the wonder of God and, and various other truths which have come before us. Uh, God's uh, great knowledge, his, um, his omniscience, we might say. And in verse 6, what does David, the psalmist, uh, indicate such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Too wonderful for me, David says. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. And we say, David, that is exactly how I feel. And that is precisely how I feel. Indeed, believer, as we read the word of God, and even with the, the smallest and the, the briefest glimpse of the sight of the glory of God, as we read the Holy Scripture, are you not overwhelmed? Are you not uh, in awe and wonder of the Almighty, the one that we, we live before, we stand before, and, and the one who has revealed these things to us, the creator of the ends of the earth, the hymn writer says, ineffably sublime? And the more we contemplate and consider the greatness of our God, we're like David here, we stand side by side with all the saints of God, and we say, Lord, these things, such knowledge, this knowledge of God, this knowledge of who he is, this knowledge as to David is revealed as one who is uh, all-knowing, all-wise. Such knowledge, he says, is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. You notice that he says that it's, it's not that it's kept from him or that he has no exposure to this. But the more he, he delves into these great truths, these deep things of the word of God, he comes to this conclusion and he's overwhelmed by this. This, this is all too wonderful for me. It is like a wall that I cannot climb and I cannot mount over. This is the psalmist's reaction to his opening prayer of adoration. And as Christians, if we are saved, we're able to teach and share. And as preachers, we can preach and we can understand. And yes, we can turn over the great themes of what we call the omniscience of God. That is, he is all-knowing. I even say from a an objective view, and I trust that you'll not be misunderstanding me when I mention this, from an objective view, we know what it means when we speak of God being all-knowing. Many of us have read books and we've studied this doctrine, we've looked into these things, and if someone presents this thought to you, God being all-knowing, in a sort of objective uh, and uh, considering, considering sense, we can look at these things and say, yes, well, I, I understand what that means, the concept of someone who is all-knowing. It's a concept that we can to an extent, get our mind around and try to illustrate and try to explain in some measure. But that we also say, when, when, when it's all analysed, when it's all considered, when it's all thought about and meditated upon, that we say we don't know. There's so much that we just don't know. 
What I'm saying is not a contradiction, although it appears something of a, a paradox. Let me try to illustrate it. For example, we, we know about the sun. Most of us know about the sun. And as you go through life and you, you start to educate yourself and you learn a few more things, well, then you start to gather more information about the sun and about other stars and other heavenly bodies. And then maybe we can try to impress people with our knowledge. We, we can quote some scientists. Well, we know how far away the sun is from the earth and, and how big it is estimated to be and how hard it's believed to be and how it affects our earth and the need that we have and all of these things. I, I don't think there's anyone really on the face of the earth that's going to deny these things which are presented before us. The sun that we see in the sky with our, with our eyes and we can only look at for a certain time. But by my asking the question, do we really know the sun? Have we entered into its very presence? You say, well, of course you can't enter into the presence of a sun because if we were to be anywhere near close to the sun, we would be consumed. Consumed before we could even think our next thought. And, and yet we know it, but we don't know it. And we have a grasp of the universe and we can throw out facts and figures. But none of us really know the universe, do we? And the more we pause and we think about its, its size, its enormity, we're, we're overwhelmed, aren't we? We're breathless, we're speechless as a result. But can I say to you, the sun, the moon, the stars, the universe, what are they in comparison to God? They are but a speck, aren't they? They're, they're nothing compared to him. And how tragic and how sad that still our day and age is characterised by such low, small thoughts of God, convenient, palatable understandings of God, and so far removed from what the scriptural record really says. And so this is what David is doing here in Psalm 139, verse 6. He knows that it is God who searches and knows him and knows his down sitting and knows his uprising, but he has to pause and he has to take a break before he goes any further. And he's got a, lot of, a longer way to go, by the way, as we shall see in a moment here. He's pausing just on this one consideration of one of the attributes of the Almighty God. And he says, You know, this knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high. I cannot attain unto it now we might say stop where you are but he doesn't does he and neither should we and he follows his exclamation with a question and in so doing he turns now to the very presence of the almighty god our god whom we adore and we worship is one who is omniscient or knowing and then one who is infinite and eternal and unchangeable in his presence if we as believers find ourselves overwhelmed at the idea of God and his infinite knowledge and from a mindset, an intellectual uh, capacity find ourselves in awe of these great thoughts that we have dealt with uh, in the previous weeks, then I might suggest to you that as we consider his presence that we must be moved in the very depth of our being. Uh, believers over the years... Um, rightly, they treasure the gracious presence of Almighty God, and so we should. We might say that if we do not know the presence of God, if we do not uh, understand what the presence of God is, really, do we know him? And certainly as believers, if we have lost it or forfeited it, what a, what a pang there is, what a pain and a sorrow fills our hearts. As believers, not just in the present day, but all throughout the ages, the genuine Christian and sincere believer has always understood the importance of, of knowing and having the presence of God. If we don't have your presence, Lord, we can't go any further. Has that not been our prayer and desire in many parts and aspects of our life? My well, dear friend, this evening as we turn to verses 7 through to 12, it is God's presence which now comes to our attention. And so I call this message to study where God is. And I use that as a leading thought to explore various themes. First of all, where God is, there is his sovereign presence. Where God is, 
There is his sovereign presence. Verse 7 and verse 8. Whither shall I flee from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now you'll notice straight away, especially in our authorised versions. Now you may have a margin that will help you in your reading. Um, you'll find often in modern versions as well that this translation is given for the word whither. It's not a word that we use in our present day. It's not modern English. It's not contemporary speech. It's old English. And most margins will give you the rendering where. And that's the very basic uh, explanation of the word whither. When we, someone says whither, they, in effect, they're speaking of the word where. That's something that we are all uh, understand, I believe. H- however, there's more of a uh, particular usage of the word that is very helpful to us. And, and it can be understood in this way. To what place? So, so when David is saying, you know, whither, whither, or he, he is saying, to what place? To what place or where should I go to that I might go from your spirit? Where should I go to that I might run from your presence? So yes, where is perfectly adequate in terms of a translation But this is what the word whither is indicating here. To what place should I go? Show me the place. Show me the realm. Show me the area that I can can run to so that I can say that I've ran and uh, gone away from the presence and the spirit of God himself. Is there such a place? Now we might ask the question, I hope you are asking the question, why would you even want to ask that? Why would that be something that uh, the psalmist brings before the Lord? I mean, this is a prayer of, of uh, adoration. This is a, a prayer of, of uh, seeking God and of worshipping him. And we say, David, why are you even asking this question in the f- first place? Where should I you know, you know, run from your spirit and from your presence? Is the, is the believer not one who wants to be in the presence of God? Do we not say that it's in the presence of God there is fullness of joy and at the right hand of God there are pleasures forevermore? Oh, there most certainly are, and there is. The child of God, when they are in sweet fellowship with the Lord, surely never wants to be away from God's abiding and near presence that he's so pleased to reveal to us when he draws near through his spirit and by his word and through the preaching of scripture. Now, as I've indicated, we can certainly, we all have to some measure on occasions, forfeited the enjoyment of the presence of God and we can miss the closeness and even the intimacy of the presence of the Lord himself. And it leaves us yearning and desiring, a bit like the uh, the, the daughter of Jerusalem, the bride in the Song of Solomon, when you see in those portions, those chapters, those earlier portions, her, 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 her sleepy condition, picturing the, the sleeping church, the backslidden people. And, the, and, the, and there's, there's not a severing, is there? The Lord is still with us, even though we're far from him, but we can know a, a distancing, a losing out, we might say. We think of the occasions in the Bible where we think of individuals who ran away. Jonah always comes to mind. He fled from the presence of God. That wasn't a good thing, was it? He always uh, knew and and was safe in the arms of the Lord, we might say, but he, he was able, and it was a dangerous thing for him, to run away from the presence of God. Adam and Eve, in the wake of their sin, hid themselves, or they believed they were hiding themselves from the presence of the Lord. But whether Jonah and Uh, Or Adam and Eve, whether they find a place like Tarshish or they try to hide themselves behind something else. They all came to the conclusion that they can't do this. And that really is what David is saying here. He's not wanting to run away from the presence of God. He's making it very clear, you can't. You can't. To what place, he says in verse 6. Shall I go from my spirit? To what place shall I flee from my presence? And the answer comes, and he knows the answer. You can't. And he wants people to know this. May even say the Lord desires us to know this. And so puts these words into the very heart of David to bring to us in Holy Scripture. By this question, therefore, he's making it very clear that there is no place a person can go to where God is not. To illustrate this, he uses what we call hyperbolic expressions. Possibly we might use the word hypothetical 
scenarios. Now, some people we know, and we probably all know someone, maybe we are that person, they tend to specialise in being dramatic for the sake of being dramatic. You get those individuals. It's a characteristic maybe that's flooring our own personality. But this is not drama, my friend. These are illustrations which are used as a way of helping us to understand the enormity of the truth of God's sovereign presence. All that as a a world that we would understand that. Be aware of it and grasp it and uh, love it and treasure it every day of our life. Have you noticed what David says now in verse 7? Whether shall I go from my spirit or whether shall I flee from my presence? If I ascend up into heaven out there, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. The word for hell, which we have here, the word for hell is shul which on some occasions in the Bible means the grave. But that usually is understood when we read the context and we understand that when the grave is being referred to uh, with respect to the burial place, if we can use that that alternative uh, language, that often in in Scripture that when that particular usage of of the word shell is in usage for grave, that it's, it's often... When, when the Lord is speaking of the resting place of the body, both of the godly and the ungodly, the, the, the body of anyone goes to the grave. But when the Lord is using this, this word sheol in reference to the place of the, of the damned, the word that we commonly think of when we hear the word hell being used, it's a different meaning altogether, isn't it? No, I believe this is exactly what the meaning is here in Psalm 139 and verse, uh, verse 8. He's, he's not referring to the physical grave where the body lays, but he's actually referring to the place of the damned. Where there is a conscious, there is a, a, a torment of the soul of those who know not God, nor his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that for good reasons and suggest it to you, I believe for valid reasons. The law of contrasts is the one that really comes to mind as, as a, a weight of evidence. But as David said prior to that in verse 8, if I ascend up into heaven, now surely David has much more than just the atmosphere. And the realm above our atmosphere, even the universe itself. Because he's speaking of his personality, he's speaking of his awareness, he's speaking of his consciousness. If I ascend up into heaven, If my awareness is there, if I understand where I am, you're there. And if I, again it's a hyperbolic expression, if I make my bed, who would make their bed in hell? But if I'm there, abiding in the depth of the place of the damned, behold thou art there. And the the word behold is drawing attention to the, the nature and the seriousness of this. These are all sobering thoughts, aren't they? Sometimes people think of hell, and, they, they, and I understand why this, this uh, phrase is used. And uh, often it's used without much um, qualification. People speak of hell being where God isn't. Now that sounds quite catchy. You know, heaven is where God is, hell is where God isn't. Well, that, that's, as, that's uh, true as far as it It goes with regard to things like his joy and his peace and his comfort and his grace because none of those things can be present in hell. That's why when everyone anyone says we live in a hell on earth, no we don't. Even if you're going through the most sorest and severest time of your life and it's something you possibly can't get your head round nor get out of in terms of your misery, it's still not a hell on earth. Because you live in the midst of a world where the grace of God is common to all. Where he's still upholding people. And he's still sustaining people. But in hell there is no presence of his joy. There is no presence of his peace. There's no comfort. There's no gladness. There's no goodness. There's no long suffering. And so yes we might say in that respect God is not there. But his presence with regard to his wrath, his anger... His judgment. God is still very much there. And when a person is being uh, punished from the presence of the Lord, it's with regard to those aspects of his goodness and grace, away from those things. But the Lord's wrath is being poured out 
for all eternity in the place of the damned. God cannot be omnipresent and yet not present in some places. And so rightly the scripture says, even there, God's presence is there. He fills heaven and earth and yea, hell itself in that respect. So for David, what he's saying here, that there's not a place. There's not a place where God isn't. We might flip this over and think what a wonderful thing this teaches us with regard to the believer being in the favour of God and Jesus Christ. If we are saved and we know the Lord Jesus Christ and we're on the arms of our blessed Saviour, we can, we can say that you know, even hell cannot touch us there. <laughs> even the worst that men can do cannot touch us there. Oh, my dear friend, you're looking for assurance for your soul? Here it is. If you're in Christ, then nothing can touch you there. This is the, the impact and the fruit, we might say, of this most blessed thought of where God is. Where God is, first of all, uh, there is his sovereign presence. Notice, secondly, where God is, there is his sufficient grace. Where God is, there is his sufficient grace. Psalm 139 and verse 9 and verse 10. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, again, notice the emphasis of Scripture, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. These are blessed thoughts, aren't they? It's very absorbing. We might even call it poetical language that the psalmist is using here. And once again, it is all used as a way of impressing on our hearts a most timely and a most important truth. I believe this truth is discovered really at the end of verse 10, when there is the emphasis which is placed that I've already brought your attention to. Even there, even there, David says, shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. The Lord wants you to understand that in the most extreme of situations, even in the worst possible scenarios, God is there. His presence is all sufficient in that sense. However, before we develop that thought a bit further, what about the words there in verse uh, 9? If I take the wings, very poetical language as I've indicated, of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Now immediately the picture I, I have in mind is of a flight. You know, taking a flight. If I take the wings, so the idea of, of taking flight and ascent that comes to me straight away. It's believed that the psalmist here is referring to the morning rays of the sun. The wings of the morning, referring to the morning rays of the sun. The first rays of every day. And David is imagining himself getting on them just as the light flies and speeds away. He creates this picture of being sped away at the speed of light. In the first thing. But not only that, not just the swiftness and the suddenness. And the means by which he can, he can leave and go somewhere else. But then he mentions uh, the uttermost parts of the sea. And he brings the two thoughts together. One remarkable statistic that I came across in my study for this message is that as of 2019, now I don't think it's suddenly changed in one year, so I think I'm com confident in saying this is still the case now, that uh, as of 2019, more than 80% of our ocean is unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored. That's amazing, isn't it? Over 80% of the ocean, or the oceans, we might say, of these worlds, are unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored. And it's hard to get your head around when you see documentaries on TV, and you know that for many years now that people have been exploring as deep as they can, and we see uh, these videos being produced in high definition quality of all of the mysteries of the deep and, and uh, fishes and sea life that we've never seen before. And we're in awe of these things. And in 80%, 80% still unexplored, unknown to mankind. Oh, what wonders are in these deeps. David says, if I take the swiftness of the speed of the morning light and I live and I dwell or I abide in the uttermost parts of the sea, no man will find me. No person can search me out in such a place as that. Ah, 
Even there, verse 10, shall thy hand lead me. And thy right hand shall hold me. Mountains, ultimately, although difficult as it may be, can be conquered by man. Valleys will be searched out. But here is a place that no mortal can go. The depth of the deepest sea. And so David says, when uh, men have exhausted their efforts, and human skill has come to an end, here is a place, O Lord, where I know that you'll still guide me. And your hand will still be upon me. It was Spurgeon who said, commenting upon these words, we could only fly from God by his own power. And what Spurgeon is saying here is that effectively you cannot fly from God. And that's brought more out in the last portion of this study that I shall bring your attention to very shortly. Now I admit there is still a difficulty in these words which we are looking at here. If I, uh, when he speaks of the, the hand leading me and my right hand holding me, uh, what I gather is this, that even if the, the rays of the sun could transport us to somewhere where we could plunge the depth of the parts of the ocean which have never been explored by mankind, it would not be done apart from God's presence leading or guiding. Nothing is apart from him. And the true, genuine believer cannot be severed from him. The Christian especially is most wonderfully comforted by this blessed truth. And so one hymn writer said, He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught, whatever I do and wherever I be, still tis Christ's hand that leadeth me. When in need, my dear Christian friend, his hand will lift you up. When you feel all alone, and sinking deep in the despair of your life, his hand will hold you and draw you near. When you are in the deepest despair, his presence will hold you true and fast. Even when, my dear friend, you're not aware. And even when you do not know he is there, he is always there. Now, believer, we must come to terms with this. We do not just hear these things and entertain romantic notions about them and think simply because they are true that you benefit from them. No, you search them out. You glean from them. You treasure them. You take them close and into your heart and you live them out day after day. We hide the reality of these things in the depth of our oceans, which is our heart. And so it comes to a day when we are in need. And we look behind and we see there's no one there. And then we realise this great truth. Even there thy right hand shall hold me. Now lastly, where God is, there is sanctifying influences. Or there is a sanctifying influence. Verse 11 and 12, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Uh, the, the Bible makes it clear that the, the Holy Spirit is pleased to work in us. Isn't that true, Christian? He's pleased to work in us. And he's, true, he's pleased to sanctify the Christian through the Holy Scriptures of truth. God's word. And, and, and so it's a very obvious thing that when we study the word of God, the truth of Scripture... That one of the things that we reveal and we dig up from Scripture is this omnipresence, God being there at all times, in all ways. And, and here, what David does now is, is he brings to the attention this, this idea that mankind historically and presently has always had. Men like to think that where there is darkness, there is a concealing, where there is a, a night, there is a hiding. Mankind has often associated the darkness of the night with the opportunity to do wrong and not be caught out. Crime, as a result, then, is often committed in the dead of night, isn't it? Not always, but often. The thinking is that no man can see me, no person can catch me, no authority can arrest me. Uh, there would not be such a, a brazenness and a boldness, a daring nature in the light of day itself. The Lord Jesus often used the contrast of day and night to make a point in his day. John 9 verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Why? The night cometh when no man can work. And Christian, we all understand the import of those words. 
Paul does the same, Romans 11, verse, Romans 13, verse 11 and 12, and that knowing the time, that now it, it is high time to wake out of sleep. What a, what a pertinent word for our day and age. Knowing the time in which we live, now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. He's not speaking of a literal night, is he? No, he's, he's speaking of something else. He says, the day is at hand. Just therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. But here, the, again, the, the comparison is being made. David says, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me. That's how people think. Maybe that's how you think. The darkness covers me, the darkness hides me, we think and imagine. Our actions are veiled by the darkness of night and that no man may see you and, and no man may not see what you're doing. What you fear and think. But God is and God does and God knows. And there is a most remarkable expression he says in verse 11, if I say, if I say, oh but what if you say David? What does God say? If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, here's the answer. Even the night shall be light about me. Even the night, even the thickest darkness of the night becomes a bright light to expose me in the eyes of God as he sees and knows us. There is no license in the night to be free to do what we wish and how we want. It is all revealed to God. It is all made known to him. To us, night and day could not be any more different in a sense, but to our God they are both alike, the psalmist says. Yeah, the darkness hideth not from thee. Uh, that sends a, uh, just a warning into our hearts. The, the darkness hides not from thee. It cannot be hid. The night shineth as the day. You see, the, again, the language which is, is being employed here. And that exposes us. Exposes our hypocrisy. I think it exposes the, the false religion of our day and the false professor. Those who entertain the ideas that by their good works and by their best efforts they're going to uh, please God. And they, they don't realise this. Don't realise that God sees all the things veiled by the darkness of their, their ways. God exposes the darkness of their deeds and their actions. No. Because they're going to be what we, by what we do and how good we are. Because the, the Lord's uh, omnipresence, it brings it all to light. It exposes us for all that we are. We can't hide. It's why the gospel is the only remedy. It's why the message of the Christian faith is the only answer. It's why Christ is the only way. Because every part of our life is turned inside out, upside down, by God's law, by his word, by his ways. And whatever we're trying to do and how we try to hide and conceal things, the Lord turns over the rock and the stone and he says, you see, you see your good works, no filthy rags. It must only be through Christ who is the light of this world. He that follows me, Jesus says, shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Are you doing that? Do you know him? Are you following him? What a terror to the unsaved are oh, these words. What foolishness to try and think that God doesn't know because you don't see him. He doesn't see you. Really? Is that the mind that we have? Becomes a means to stimulate the life of the believer. I think David drew great comfort from this. When in his dark moments, the Lord brought light and comfort. And so here was a man, whatever the historical moment was for this psalm, he knew that it is God who is, and where God is, of most importance. God's gracious and sovereign presence. To what place can we go from his spirit, or hide from his presence, or flee from his very being? Thank God we can't. So where do we go? My friend, we hide ourselves in Christ, the rock of ages, who is clear for us. May God bless these few thoughts to us. Let me close in prayer. Blessed Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to our hearts, for showing us these things. We're humbled by them. And we pray, Lord, that you will teach us in your ways. We pray that you bless all of thy people, thy church, make it strong and courageous in these days. And give us, Lord, times of refreshing. Grant, Lord, that the doors of churches will be opened. And that, Lord, this virus will be done away with. And that, most importantly, souls will be sobered and brought to Christ in our generation. 
Hear our cry, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.